This is Waystoids. This is Waystoids. This is Waystoids. This is Waystoids. Hey, this is Jason, and we've got some cool news. Waystoids is coming to our favorite streaming service, Night Flight Plus, on September 30th with a four-episode anthology series baked and fried in the Sonoran Desert and New York City. It features some of our favorite out-of-sight live performances from bands like Wednesday, Super Crush, Betrayal of Guilt, Reptalians, and more, plus oddball skits, video segments, and more lo-fi fever dreams. Wastoids is only available on Night Flight Plus. And because we're so excited, we figured we'd celebrate with Mr. Night Flight himself on this episode of Wastoids With. That's right, we've got Stuart S. Shapiro. He launched his career as a concert promoter and independent film distributor in the early 70s, working with movies like Tunnel Vision and Neil Young's Rust Never Sleeps. In 1981, he created Night Flight, ushering in a pre-MTV vision that encompassed everything from dubbed out reggae to anarchic punk rock botched heavy metal, and sleek new world. He's also the author of a book, Identify Yourself, A Journey in Fuck You Creative Courage. And in 2016, he relaunched Night Flight as a streaming channel, packed with hundreds of wild horror and sci-fi clips, a huge library of music documentaries, original Night Flight programming, and now, Waste Thoughts. We recorded this talk a few weeks back when we were in New York for band shirt Rough Trade and Rockefeller Center's Indie Plaza Fest, and we're pleased to share it with you now as a teaser for our launch on September 30th. Head over to nightflightplus.com backslash promo code and enter our code, Wastoids, for $10 off your annual subscription. All right, let's get dazed. Here's Stuart S. Shapiro on Wastoids with. So, so we're really thrilled to get the chance to hang out and talk with you. Okay. We'll get into it. So... When Night Flight debuted, the evening it, it debuted, I think, if my notes are right, it was June 5th, 1981? Yeah, 1981, yeah. Friday night. What was that night like for you? Well, the most interesting part of that night was a USA Network had an uplink in uh, New Jersey. Um, and actually, it was in this building, which I think was, when it, it was the original building that started... Um, I think an FM radio broadcast or whatever, and they had um, three one-inch machines in it. And um, what I remember more than watching it on TV, I remember driving the Air Masters out to New Jersey myself, um, I think probably Friday afternoon. Um, and the show was, I, I think the show was only two hours long, the first show. Right. Right. Um, welcome to New York, boys. Yeah, I love that we got audio verite going <laughs> yeah. for, for our, yeah, our conversation. Yeah, we're in New York. We're on First Avenue, New York City, rock and roll with everybody. Beautiful apartment. Thank Beautiful you. Place. Yeah, cool. We're cool. We've been here for a long time. Uh, worked a lot of stuff out of here. Um, so you know, um, the genesis of Night Flight was. For, for many years, um, I had started a company called International Harmony, which was an independent film distribution company. I started that in 1976, and my first film was Tunnel Vision, and um, probably my most well-known film was Rust Never Sleeps with Neil Young. Yeah, I got fantastic. a chance to go out and actually... Neil hadn't finished the film, and he really didn't have a distributor, didn't know really what he wanted to do, and I, I gave him the kind of... Uh, presentation that we could really make a, a major uh, release with it. So I had um, Reggae Sunsplash, The Day the Music Died, the Sex Pistols DOA, Jimmy Plays Berkeley, you know, just a whole slew of rock and roll films and a small amount of horror films. And in those days, 1976, the late 70s, the um, midnight movie business was huge and um we distributed our films with some other films uh, around the country and we probably had a hundred theaters every weekend literally selling out 11 o'clock 12 o'clock at night back in those days yeah 
you could smoke pot in the movie theaters. Nobody gave a shit. So it was and, a, pretty, a pretty different experience than when you go to see a movie now. Yeah, I yeah, guess. no, totally. I mean, it was really <laughs> rock and roll time. You bring in your beers, people throwing up all over the fucking place. And, yeah, um, cool. And it was really, a, you know, a social event. A lot of people, when they think about midnight movies, they think about Rocky Horror Picture Show. But there was really a culture, a rock and roll culture outside of the pure rocky horror theatrical uh type of event that was going on and um it was prolific everywhere and in those days cable television hadn't really started yet so we were in like new york city and um generally um manhattan cable which was the main cable company uh, uh in new york was really going off the air at like 12 o'clock at night you know right the, right you know, the little the, the uh oh the uh, the, the native the head native, or whatever native yeah, head yeah 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 sitting there 12 one o'clock and you know meanwhile i'm filling out movie theaters till like three o'clock in the morning people are just completely selling out 100 theaters a, a weekend and i realized that you know there was a convergence that was missing and it seemed obvious to me that not only are they coming home at three o'clock in the morning, there's nothing to watch, but also if there is, you know, three or four or 5,000 people a weekend going out to movie theaters at 12 o'clock at night, there's a whole audience of people that want to see stuff. So there was a clear, um, gap culturally, uh, and, and just psychographically, you know, in the, in the universe. Right. And then the other thing is you kind of get, um, you know, you live in New York city or you live in LA or you live in a major city on the east or the west coast. And, you know, you think the world is round, but in the middle of America, the world is flat. <laughs> and if you're a punk and you live in a small town in the middle of America and you're the only guy that really looks like you and acts like you, you don't really, you, you know, you don't know that there's another world out there. So the ability for us at Night Flight to be able to present a counterculture experience that ranged from, you know, not just music or heavy metal or reggae, but, you know, foreign films and documentary films and video art and crazy shit. And then, of course, new wave theater and punk. Right. Really, right. Uh, really opened the world that the world was really round in the middle of America as well. When I watch the broadcasts and when I think about it, it's it 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 seems anarchic to me. I mean, there's just sort of a mix of a lot of different things. But in that anarchic sense, there's also a sensibility and like a kind of a through line, you know. But obviously, you're pulling everything from old public domain cartoons and, like you said, heavy metal. You've got the Hit Parader crew. You've got yeah, Peter yeah. Ivers. You've got yeah. all this stuff going on. Did you have, was there like a connective thread for the material for you? Was there a quality that you would look for? Like, this is going to be night, night flight worthy because of whatever reason. Um, absolutely. Um, but it's not something that you necessarily design. I've been kind of lucky personally in a sense that night flight has been my, you know, my persona, my personal extension. And I've been pretty much musically and culturally lived on the edge my whole life one way or another is always like over the edge or on the edge and yeah. and um on one hand personally but on the other hand uh, i I've, I've always felt like i was a cultural evangelist and it was my spiritual duty because uh, i had the power to be able to aggregate and find platforms whether they were movie platforms or tv platforms or night flight but that my you know, my mission was to be able to break ground and present something that was new, fresh. And I kind of, if there was any kind of theme, it was always a theme of discovery. The thing that was really neat about Night Flight, and it was linear, remember? So, and, you know, for the most part, you could tape it and then watch it later on VHS and everybody, it was really one of the original right. shows that taped. But clearly, the concept was discovery you know see shit you've never seen before hear stuff you've never heard before and you know always be sort of aware that you are going to get wowed somehow yeah so i mean that yeah. that i think is like you know total theme on that level in those early days obviously mtv comes along but i'm really interested in that moment right before music videos sort of become a format that people can wrap their heads around people like 
Mike Nesmith from the Monkees, you know, was sort of doing these like weird, taking the promo video, which was probably something you were very familiar with, um, and expanding it and trying to come up with this new sort of third thing that wasn't just the song and it wasn't just visuals. It was something that worked holistically. With that and the emergence of MTV, what do you think was in the air? What sense did you, I mean, did you feel, first off, let, let's rephrase. Let's be a little more specific. Did you feel like MTV was like, you know, brand Eck or whatever? Were they the, were they the they distinguished were the straight competition? They were the, yeah, they no, were they the weren't competition. They were, they were, we, were, we had no competition. There was nothing like Night <laughs> Flight. We were the anti uh, MTV. I mean, M- MTV was the straight, was just straight. Um, it was formatic. It was like, you know, the equivalent of, you know, top 40 AM versus an FM DJ. Sure. Um, right, right, right. So, um, in fact, at one point, MTV was actually taking advertisements on night flight during night flight. And then we did turn around the other way and actually did some cool ads on, on MTV, but they were, I never saw them. I mean, they were actually p- p- not competition, but they presented the yin yang of who we were, you know. So they're the straight right. man, we're the non straight man. And then, right. you know, that was easy to perform on that basis. Because the other thing about MTV was it didn't really have any intellectual consciousness to it. You know, when we approached Night Flight, there was always a thematic structure to the, um, the formatting. Um, you know, sure. all of our video shows would string together some something that was intellectually, thematically um, tying stuff together. Right. Um, I was the first person to uh, put a, a video director's uh, ID on our on our music videos. Right. Because we, you know, I come from the film business. I come from that world that the director is a very important component. And in fact, you know, the directors uh, and the early directors, went, many of them went on to be great, great filmmakers. Sure, sure. So, yeah, having that sense of like a thematic cohesion was really important. I think about the takeoff segments, take off to insert topic or idea and then the way you could kind of really build a show with a kind of strong editorial stance almost, you know, which is the, the idea of something like Night Flight now, it feels to me like. Most programming now doesn't allow for the kind of discovery that was baked into the night flight concept. And so when I watch this stuff, I'm really moved and excited by the idea that you would sit down on a night and you wouldn't know what was going to happen. And you wouldn't really have any way of knowing what was going to happen. And it just feels so anti-algorithmic, you know? Like now everything is like, we're going to figure this person out and we're going to program the entertainment for them. We're going to program culture forum and it just seems like going back you guys were on a completely different trip than that that had yeah well i mean algorithms are definitely not punk well no there's nothing punk punk about algorithms they're they're not you know (laughs) and you know we're punk in our dna so you know i mean if there was such a thing as a punk algorithm i guess you know it would be cool in a way but you know it's probably you know just be heavy metal over here or something like that right right so uh, the discovery is interesting. I mean, and, and you know, we 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 really have to talk about what Night Flight is now and how does that present discovery. But it, you know, in the old days, you had a linear program and it was analog. So you know, and the way I had to produce, so I had to produce eight hours of program a week, four hours on Friday night and four hours on Saturday night. So I had to create pods, and and that they so that I could build half hour segments which is why the you know the takeoff or the visions or the profiles and you know and they and we built them into half hour shows and then we always played a feature film so it was able to construct a four hour program two times a week and we had no breaks so i was making these 52 weeks a year wow and you know and it, so there was a there had to be a format to be able to scale that uh, well, I mean, I'm I'm pulled in two different directions. One, I want to I want to hear more about what those working hours were like. I mean, that's insane, kind they're, of like that's in, that's pretty insane nose to the grindstone stuff. Well, let's see. Um, all I can tell you is for six years in a row, um, I started 
I ran um, at National Video on 42nd Street, and we had, um, once we got going, we, you know, we, um, and we had to produce it eight hours a week. I had two or three studios going, and I worked in the studio from 7 o'clock at night till 2 o'clock in the morning, yeah. Monday through Thursday. Okay. And then I got up in the morning, you know, and got to work in the office from like 11 to 7, and... Um, you know, worked on editorial and acquisition and editing because we we edited in, in rough edits and then we went into the studio. Right. And in those days it was analog. So if you made a mistake, you had to go back to the beginning. Yeah. But the thing you have to realize, you started to ask about, you know, one of the 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 technology components that's that made music videos allowed to happen was the introduction of the one inch Sony tape machine. Mm. So the prior to that, videotapes were two inch, and you could never sync up a two inch machine. It was a single unit fee to. Once the one out, one inch machines came out, welcome to New York yeah. again. <laughs> <laughs> it's illegal yeah. to talk about one inch machines. They're coming to get yeah, us. Right. Yeah, right. Yeah. So one inch machines started. <laughs> Yeah, I think they came out, you know, maybe like 1980, 1979, 1980. And that was the ability to be able to take three machines and play down to one master. So you could have the ability to to sync, do effects. And then also the first boxes came out of England. Todd Rundgren, actually, he had the first video effect box up in Woodstock. And I used to go up to Todd's studio and, and work there for, for days and hours on end. So the, the, the ability for special effects and, and layered videos really enabled music videos to have the kind of s- format that made them right. music videos. Yeah, that created what we now take for granted, probably, right. you know? Yeah. Uh, it's funny that you mentioned Rundgren. I, I put him down in my notes, too, because you've, you've done some work with Todd, right? And I did, I did. Uh, uh, well, originally, I, I Todd had the absolute shit studio in America. He, got, he brought from England the first uh, special effects console, um, and I mean, I'm sure it was hundreds of thousands of dollars back right, there. And he right. had a studio up in Woodstock. He had his own place there. And Todd did some of the original music videos that there ever were. So yeah. I did work there. I didn't necessarily work with Todd in the studio, but I worked in his studio. Then many years later, Todd and myself and Danny Goldberg started uh, Artist and, and Patronet. Now, Todd had Patronet before I joined with him. And um, Patronet was really the first artist subscription service that there ever was. So it was like 1998 or so. And the concept was, which Todd did, was you would buy an annual subscription to Todd's output and he would release every month or whatever a new track or whatever. And you would kind of be part of his release schedule privately. And then he, he would, at the end of the year put it all together and ship you a CD. Yeah. So we tried to turn that into a model. Uh, it didn't work. You know, we were way too early with everything. But. Just just ahead of your time, though, because <laughs> yeah, now, yeah, yeah, now artists yeah. are doing it Patreon and, and, well, and like are, all these different they, yeah, services. I mean, it's they, interesting. They, they sort of are, but they're really not. I mean, Patreon, well, first of all, Todd programmed it, and, mm-hmm. you know, he had a, a sense of coding and it was really a quite, it was really designed to be an ongoing release of f- individual singles right, that right. would be then put together in a CD. So, I mean, Pat- Patreon is really an is, it's like a it's it's sort of like that, but you know you're supporting an artist, right? And depending right. on the artist, like my son has a site, Brian Dolphin, he has a site, and he releases every single month a, a new. A new piece uh, uh, music that he either produces by getting other artists that he produces or his own stuff. I'm not sure how many artists in Patreon actually release monthly to right, support right. their services or not. But it is the same concept. There's no question about it. It's just, it's yeah, it's fascinating to me because it seems to me like you've had your eye on... 
Well, I mean, I so I read your book, Identify Yourself, a, a Journey in Fuck You, Creative Courage, which is a pretty great title, I'm going to go ahead and say. Um, but it seems to me like you've got a pretty keen sense of looking for an opportunity and recognizing where there is a, a, a niche to be filled. It's interesting to me when I think about, like, I'm sure you've had this happen. You scroll Netflix forever, you can't find anything you want to watch. You switch over to some other streaming service and you look through all that and you go, I don't want to watch any of this shit either. And it's just like this bizarre, the the paralysis of infinite availability, you know? Um, One of the things I like so much about Night Flight Plus, though, is that whether or not, there's lots to watch on Night Flight, too, you know, and you can check out all sorts of stuff, but none of it is exactly what you would see on some other service. And that really makes me feel like you've got that, that niche defined a little bit, but in an informa- in the information age, like what, what are, you know, what would you lo- like to see happen with night flight plus that you still haven't, haven't seen happen? Well, um, more of, you know, uh, Night Flight, I, I look at Night Flight Plus and Night Flight, I, I use the word the Night Flight Library. I believe yeah. I'm a library and I'm a museum. So mm. I'm constantly collecting. Um, I'd like to have more public access shows. Um, uh, you know, I think that Night Flight sh- should always have its eye on collecting out there, you know, um, various shows that have been around the country that, you know, just haven't gone anywhere or whatever. So it's more than just, you know, um, feature films or whatever, like, you know, Gumby. I fucking love Gumby. I mean, you know, so Gumby, who, you know, where are you going to watch a Gumby episode? You're not going to watch it. So that, uh, Dr. Ruth with having anthrax on Dr. Ruth. Um, so there's, there's kind of like a collectability to that. But you brought up something really uh, important, and that is, and by the way, it happens on Night Flight too. So, uh, you know, before I started NFTV, which is the linear feed on Plus, right? I always felt that there were really two metaphors. You know, sometimes they say lean in and like, uh, lean forward and lean back, right? So, we've all gone a million times on Netflix and HBO and Peacock and every fucking channel that you can possibly lose, including night flight <laughs> and uh, what am i going to watch and right. you don't know what you want to go watch and then what i was finding myself is uh fuck it i'm just going to turn on hbo and whatever's there i'm going to watch for 15 minutes right sure so that's what led me to believe that you know the original metaphor of night flight was turn on a channel and whatever is on you're going to watch for a while so we started the linear feed nftv within plus and every Friday night, we pre-program at least 50 different episodes for the week that are a linear feed. So you can actually turn on, you know, I don't know what I want to watch on Night Flight. So I push that one button and what's on there is going to be something I've never seen no matter what it is. Yeah. So we have that feed and then we have the, you know, the music video feed, the NFTVI, which is the independent music videos, which is kind of another genre. I'm still struggling with that because I don't think it's as strong as it, it should be. And we're kind of like, you know, it's hard to figure where we, you know, maybe uh, waste storage belongs there to some degree. But sure, uh, we're sure. probably going to consolidate. We're, we're upgrading the entire infrastructure. Um, one of the disappointing parts of the NFTV is you have no fucking idea what you're watching because there's no electronic program guide. Right. So we right, are right. We're, our new our new upgraded software will have a program guide, so that so you're able to you're gonna if, if you really like something well, you know yeah, what it but is. But also you're gonna what is this? I have no yeah. idea what this is. You know. And, <laughs> sure. Sure. And I don't even know what it is half the time. So right. Um, that's important. Um, but I'm I'm constantly believing that night flight is a library and a museum at the, t- at the same time. So I think you need to percolate up out of this vast library, not right. just stuff that's just new, but like, Hey, this is a, this, this is a must see movie or this is a must see segment. And, you know, cause we have thousands of subscribers, but you know, they're, it's weird. I mean, uh, well, so I think that's important. Everybody needs a, a helping hand in terms of, 
you know, recommendation. And also, yeah. what Wastoids is going to say or must see is going to be very different than, say, what the folks at Drag City Records are going to say is a must see or that's Sacred true. Bones. And yeah, that, yeah, yeah, and that's that, true. that makes it even more that human over the algorithm type thing, which I'm just more and more drawn to as yeah, I. Yeah, that's a it, good point. And that's important, actually. Um, again, generally, all of our, uh, our partners, share the same dna sure There's the, and there yeah. is an anarchistic cutting edge dna that we all share so yeah you may be more into heavy metal or they may be over into you know a little bit more electronic or whatever but there's something cutting and cool that we all share yeah yeah i'm always telling people to go watch the disinfo tv stuff that, well I'm that re- is pretty fucking cool stuff i'm really into that, that, that I'm, is, I'm, pretty, I'm into, I'm that into gets all a that. lot of play actually that's pretty cool stuff and that was undiscovered i mean that was like yeah. just nowhere have you ever gone to the record store and picked up a record and got it home put it on your turntable only to find that it's all hissy and it's got pops and there's smudges all over it it's a real drag That's the thing about vinyl. It sounds its best when you're working with a clean record. And that is why I dig Groove Washer. Their products are designed and made in Kansas City, Missouri, right here in the U.S., by people who are as passionate about music and vinyl as you are. Groove Washer offers everything you need to ensure your records sound their best, with cleaning fluids for every available cleaning method, be it manual, vacuum, or ultrasonic if you want to go real in on it. We've got a special deal for Waste Toys listeners, too. Head over to www.groovewasher.com and enter the discount code WASTOIDS10 to get 10% off your record cleaning supplies. That's WASTOIDS10 in all caps. Enter that at checkout at groovewasher.com and get 10% off everything you need to keep your vinyl clean and pristine. Thanks, Groove Washer. I want to I want to go back and ask you you've mentioned a couple times that you use sort of the, the punky phrase you know and I and I'm really interested in you know you were you were well into music before the punk boom uh you were you were pretty into cutting edge rock and really on that what did it feel like as the punk movement started to emerge and what drew you to that scene do you remember the first punk band you saw I I I have to say I don't think my taste is that punky. Sure. I uh I was uh I was in love with the clash from the beginning. I guess the clash is a you know quintessent punk band. Yeah. I really wasn't into the Sex Pistols. Um I shot Johnny Thunders because I thought Johnny Thunders was fucking brilliant. I did like the dolls. Oh the dolls are yeah. I like the dolls. But I you know, I went to CBGB's, you know. Um, and then, you know, and then you, then I have like new wave theater. I, I mean, to this day, I can't watch a whole segment of new wave theater and get through it. It's still too harsh for, yeah. like, for me. It's not like, <laughs> oh man, dead Kennedys. I can't wait to watch them again. Yeah. Uh, sure, sure, sure. You know, um, so I, I think that it's not my personal taste necessarily, but it was the fact that I, I, I needed to have that on the network, on the show, right? because it was important for us to portray that side of the music world. It wasn't like, oh man, I'm like, I, I'm totally into this. It wasn't, that's, you know, yeah. uh, my tastes were really wide in range. I mean, I, you know, I like Milton Nascimento more than I like the Dead Kennedys. You okay. Know? Yeah. Um, uh, understood for sure. But you were, dr- but you thought the energy was apparent. You could the see that from like... Yeah, the energy... I mean, and then you bring up today, but, but I was always political. Sure, and sure. The energy in the seventies was political, so the punkness of the of the movement, I believe, was you, you know, in one hand, social, but social could also be political. And if you think about you know, anarchistic move, movement within music. It's social, but it's also political. The you know the 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 root of of fuck you, the root of independence, the defiance, um, the rawness. Um, that is something that 
I'm always been attracted to. Not necessarily the hardcore fucking rash guitar sure. in your face. Yeah, I know. Totally, totally. More of a punk I'm much more spirit. of a Neil Young. I mean, you know, if I'm going to go listen to music... Neil's got some. Know, Neil's Neil's got yeah, some pretty know, some pretty heavy tunes. Yeah, he for does. Sure. He's got raunchy <laughs> shit. It really, you know, he got he got raunchy. But you know, I I'll go to Eric Clapton. Sure. Um, I was a Hendrix fan from day one. Always a Hendrix fan. Hendrix, one of the uh, Jimmy Jimmy plays Berkeley was one of the films that you were really instrumental in in distributing. Right? We did distribute it. Wasn't my film originally? It was a New Line Cinema film, but I did play Jimmy plays Berkeley, and then I actually had. On my first video cassette label, which was called Harmony Vision, mm-hmm. in 1978, I released Jimmy Plays Berkeley and Pink Flamingos on on, uh, on the first video. Pink Flamingos must have absolutely flipped people's lids. Yeah, it did. I mean, it still, still does. It still, still does. does. It's but... like New Wave Theater. It still completely does. What did you? Uh, how did you hear about Peter Ivers and and New Wave Theater? Because again, that's one of my. I actually I like you know the music. I can get down with a lot of the the tunes featured on the show, but I'm more interested in Peter as Pe- just a character. Yeah, Peter He's Ivers is absolute a raging genius. genius, 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 genius. But yeah. also David Job. David Job wrote Peter Ivers' monologues. Right. So David Job, you know, two geniuses, two wild men. Right. Um, David Job walked into our office. I was not in. I mean, L, the first season of New Wave Theater was in L.A. on on public access. Right. Um, and I wasn't in L.A. I was in New York. And David Job just came into our offices one day, or I think he may have sent us a video in advance, and it was like, "Holy shit! This is like way the fuck out." And then David was way the fuck out. And you know, it was a it was it was more than love at first sight. You know, David was scary. He was always scary. David carried a gun all the time, you know, and he was like wild man. And, you know, there was just coke all the time everywhere. Yeah. And acid everywhere. And Yeah. Uh, but New Wave Theater was scary. It Absolutely. It really was. And we, you know, the funniest thing about New Wave Theater that I always love is it, it we had, it was four hour show. So it had to be on at the very last half hour of Night Flight, the four hours. In the first two years of Night Flight, USA Network had only one transponder. So what went on at 2.30 in the morning in New York City was three hours earlier in L.A. And, you know, Night Flight went on prime time in, you know, at 8 o'clock. At, yeah. You know, and so, you know, it was 11.30 at night. New Wave Theater would go on in L.A. And it was raw and 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 crazy. But, you know, USA didn't really think about it. They were, their consciousness was okay, New Wave Theater's on at 2.30 in the morning, nobody cares. And stuff. Sure, sure. So you're putting that yeah. out into the world, uh, you know, on the West Coast, right in kind of like that coveted spot. That's amazing. But New Wave Theater, I think if anything, New Wave Theater was a beacon in the middle of America to any individual that was a disenfranchised punk that didn't have any access to that kind of music or that kind of culture right. and didn't know it existed. Yeah, yeah. In terms of people being able to sort of find their people, find the others. That or they whatever, weren't you know? alone yeah. Yeah, in exactly. the universe. Exactly. That's interesting. So did you, I mean, you, you, you felt, I mean, did that, did that sort of like spiritual desire to evangelize for outsider weirdo culture was that something that fueled you in the early days with with harmony as well I yeah mean, always my whole life yeah my whole life was where's there. that come from <laughs> um i think I, probably a tough I, question you know I, I like okay i mean it, it's like all the way back i i um i went to prep school and i was a social chairman in prep school and I think in my junior year for the prom, I hired a rock and roll band without telling them, and they wanted to throw me out of school. So, yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know, that's funny. But it's like you know, 1964. Um, it's hard to imagine. You know, your prom band was like you know, a complete you know, outrageous. But <laughs> I, I always was that person. Um, as much as I grew up um, at Tanglewood watching Arthur Fiedler and Leonard Bernstein and the Berkshires and, right, and the Dave classic. Brubeck, uh, classic. So I, I was, I was 
sort of, I would say, trained and educated as a more classic jazz and and and, cl- and I did take classical piano. But um, you know, as soon as I started to get high and fucked up, I yeah. opened up my world. Oh, well, sure. Was uh, you know, like I said, I've I've read the book, so you you talk about you talk about you talk about drugs in in your book. Um, was was night flight the sort of thing you could work on uh, while high, while baked, or you know, were cert were certain drugs more conducive to the creative process than others? Yeah, well, I mean, I mean, listen, you can't talk about being in rock and roll in the eighties without talking about cocaine. Uh, particularly, yeah. I mean, I don't know. I mean, New York in the eighties, every single person was high on coke all the time, all day long, all night long. And I can't really think that uh, cocaine was a creative drug. Sure, it was a uh, you know, um, uh, there's a madness about coke. There's a obsession that it creates in you. Um, pot is a creative. Weed's a creative drug. You know. I, I, to this day, you know, um, if I smoke, like, just like last week, I, you know, I, I, I live on a lake and I, we swim, my wife and I, we swim every day in a lake and normally I swim straight, but last week I, I, I took a poke of, 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 a, of a, a bowl and went for a swim, you know, and I'm in the middle of the lake and like, fuck my eye, my mind is opening up and I came up with this great line and, you know, there's nothing yeah. in, for me. I still think weed is really the most creative uh, aspect of drugs. Coke is a fucked up drug. Yeah, I don't, sure. I haven't done coke in you know forever, but we did coke all the time. As a matter of fact, I ran away from night flight because of coke. Because left, of the culture of yeah, coke, and you cult, needed to get yeah, out of it. I needed to save my life. I had a kid. My kid was finally born after many years, and you know, night flight didn't have a break. And we were all high all the time. We, I mean, we produced so much shit. It was, un, you know, I, I don't know if I, what it would have been like to do it all straight. I don't, you know, we weren't straight. Well, who knows? Uh, I mean, you're talking about some pretty intense hours. Yeah. It might have been. Yeah, we were, and we did a lot of coke and we were crazy. But, uh, and then I couldn't break it. It wasn't that I was addicted to the drug as much as the whole universe of New York was addicted to it. You sure. couldn't go into a record meeting and you couldn't go anywhere um everybody walked around with a vial of coke and you know you couldn't say hello to anybody without taking a one-on-one and and if you didn't they didn't trust you right oh you're he's fucking straight we can't deal with him right right so i had a i had a run away from that yeah which i did a lot of the book identify yourself which you know uh i really enjoyed first off i enjoyed the the way it's laid out it's it's like it's very much like agitprop cool like i i mean i i i'm gonna use the term propaganda in a good way you know the yeah. way it's laid out i mean certain words huge smaller you know alternating sizes you're doing a lot of really interesting things with the type uh your wife Lori, she did design she did. it and laid it out it's you know it, it is a it's poetic it's you know i i kind of write in a poetic meter to some degree sure I mean, to sure. a big degree was this something was this book something you were kicking around as an idea for a while uh, i had, had been you... writing it for a long time and i and it was important uh it was an important expression um i felt um i like to write it's hard to write but i felt um that i had wisdom to um to generate and and wisdom to to give and my focus really was to try to use anecdotal stories to uh, short and but anecdotal with all of them sort of having a meaning within them but to the general sense was um, to give young people the sense that um, from my perspective that it's okay to fail that failure is creative that through failure you 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 evolve into your and if they're in the creative world failure is part of the process and it's all about the process right it's really not about the final product your your process is every day and i felt i had something to give to that that could give people um that read it 
uh, courage. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I had a friend, I gave the book away to a, a friend a couple of weeks ago, older guy. And, uh, he uh, I, he read it. He read it all in one night, and I and I saw him the next day. And he said, "Well, I got to tell you, I read your book, and I called my daughter of thirty five years and told her not only do I love her, but I really really respect what she's doing. And I hadn't done that in like ten years. Wow. So you know, yeah. like yeah, you know, you get that. I said, okay, great. That's like such a reward when you know you can have that. So it's not you know it's not like a narrative story, but it's a story." to try to generate a sense of movement and courage in your own life. And, and it does work. I had one friend uh, who read it and she was just afraid to ask her boss that she not only wanted to raise, but she wanted to change her position within she was a fucking rock star in a company. And she was afraid to like, just go in and like say, I want, I, I want to move over to here. Yeah. And she read my book. Yeah. And she said, I finished your book or finished a chapter and I went in Monday morning and I said, I told him, you know, you somehow you gave me that, just that courage. That I used sure, over and over sure. Again. So that's what I've felt from a lot of people that have gotten back to me. And not a lot because it's, you know, the book hasn't really been well read or well um, been put out there to the degree that I had hoped it was. But when you see that effect, it's rewarding. Yeah. So we haven't talked about the movie store, which probably and by the time this comes out i think the movie store will be live okay killer so um you know you talk about you know where do you go how do you what's the transformation of content and you know so you got streaming you got svod you got avod well um from my perspective i felt that the the next that i would call transformative component of a library is that you you as a collector me as a collector or anybody a night flight person wants to have their own digital library and uh just like you know if you think about the music business is pretty much driven by vinyl which is a collector's business the video business is driven by blu-ray which is generally you know, good film to tape transfers or original shit that's sort of really upscaled. Sure. And that's collectors. But there's no digital collectors and there's no digital libraries. So today, you basically have four companies that you can buy or rent movies from. You got Apple and Google and Vudu and, and Amazon. And, you know, if you want to, you know, where's Rust Never Sleeps? Well, actually, it is on you know, Apple, but who the fuck knows it's there. Right. So I decided, and uh, over 20 years ago, I, I, um, when I first started playing around with the internet, I bought the movie store.com, which I have never used in 20 years. Oh, wow. So i have now about to launch the movie store. It's called the movie store. And I'm sort of saying it's like your movie wallet. And the concept is twofold. One, build it, you know, ultimately with a hundred of the best collectible films for our DNA from the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, a hundred films for each decade of movies that you need to own in your library and um, that you can take anywhere, own them and, you know, download them so you, you know, can yeah, stick them on a- your terabyte flash drive, put it on your keychain, Right. And, you know, you're on a movie, you're on a airplane train whatever anywhere you are you got plug it in you got your fucking movies and then you own it you don't have you to worry it. about them at you some own point it you don't have to worry whether it's, it's online go at yeah, apple right. or amazon where it is oh i got no connectivity i can't fucking listen to it right you know, right, right. Of, you know we're all even if you think about itunes music library you know if you don't download it onto your computer and you're and you're on the airplane and there's no connectivity oh, yeah. you can't listen to your own fucking library right 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 so I like the next generation of the component of Night Flight is to have the movie store. And so collectible classics on one hand, but then also new films um, that are out 
that either you can rent uh, and that will promote and market and feature, whether it's, um, you know, independent films or, you know, there's not that many music films that are coming out, but, you know, horror films, independent music, documentary that yeah. you can rent and have or own. Yeah. And so we're launching a movie store and I'm really excited about it. I think it's next gen night flight and, and it's sort of the sister uh, platform of night flight plus. Well, that's I'm really excited about it. That's killer. And Stuart, I mean, we'll have to do, we'll have to talk more. I mean, I have a million other things I want to ask you about. I want to ask you. Yeah. I want to, I want to ask you if you told Neil when you guys were, when Russ never sleeps, like, did you, do you remember hearing about the, the Jawas thing that George Lucas wanted? Wasn't George Lucas pissed about that? Oh, I don't remember if he was pissed about it, but I'll tell you what, you had him come I'll out tell on you stage. one of my so cool. greatest <laughs> shows that I ever, uh, ever did and you know of course we got tons of stuff we could talk about woodstock 99 you know we, we didn't even get that, into woodstock 99 I know, I know, I know, oh my god <laughs> so my dream with russ never sleeps was to have a actual film presentation with a stack of monitors like it was Those a marshall concert. yeah 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 you know like a concert yeah and we premiered rust at the old palladium on 14th street and we had over 2000 people in the audience and i had the 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 stack of of uh speakers and it was on a big fucking screen and uh, neil wasn't there but it was like literally 2000 people and it was like a movie concert and it was that was one of my greatest yeah. concert ex nights i ever had in my life oh that's um, so cool and uh you know actually you know rest of receipts was really successful for, for neil it played all over the country and it was really a cool film yeah um the you know the the sizing and everything but it was really the music was brilliant and in the way it was broken up and the you know, two two sections. I don't know if you you watched Russ in a, ever, but it's oh yeah, I've definitely it's a special watched it. special concert film. Yeah. Well, thank you for your time and also for your effort getting all this cool stuff out into the world. And here we are, all these decades later, able to appreciate it. Yeah. And of course, dig into all the cool new stuff that you've got going too. So waste stories. Waste here stories. we go. We're very, gonna very we're gonna cool. do it. Very We're, cool, cutting edge, like uh, oh. you know the. New Wave Theater of uh, 2022. There oh, you go. Man. You guys are Holy on the cutting edge. You got some cool <laughs> shit. Very <Holy> punky. <laughs> Good little anarchistic fucking hit there. Yeah, there and, you go. Yeah. And new bands. Yeah. Well done. And it belongs on Night Flight. And let's, you know, yeah. may it be the beginning of a long run together. Absolutely. Stuart, thanks so much for your time. You got it, man. Rock and roll. Thanks for checking out another Wastoids podcast. You can find us wherever you listen to podcasts. Check out our other shows, Click Vortex, featuring my online adventures with Sam Means of the Format, and The Spindle, featuring Mark Masters and John Howard discussing a cool 7-inch record each episode. And check out our streaming channel debut over at Nightflight on September 30th. Want to check the show out? Head over to nightflightplus.com backslash promo code and use our code Wastoids in all caps for $10 off your annual subscription. Want to let people know what they should be watching on Nightfly Plus? Give us a call at 1 877 Wastoids and drop your recommendation. We'll play your message here in the podcast feed. Thanks for hanging out. 